I'm Bob Geller. Welcome to this episode of PR Done and Dunner. I am very excited to welcome our next guest. He has a storied career in the tech field. He's been a writer for top publications, including Fortune, The Atlantic, Fast Company, and many more. He's written several books and is now a marketing consultant. He's also a musician. We both share a love for making loud rock music, and he has a band which is probably better than my band, but I know it's not a contest. Anyway, he's a true polymath, someone I've had the pleasure to get to know over the past few years. I'm thrilled to welcome Kevin Maney, who wrote or co-wrote the book, Playing Bigger. Welcome, Kevin. How are you? Hey, Bob. I'm, I'm fine. And, and I, I, I want to correct one quick thing um, that uh, uh, our firm category design advisors considers ourselves strategic advisors, not marketing advisors, uh, because what we're going to talk about with category design has to be a whole company strategy, um, not just a marketing strategy, but marketing plays a huge role in that and PR plays a huge role. So let's, let's get at it. Full title is how pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. Or rather that's a subtitle. But it's about playing bigger. And it's something that I think uh, that the idea should be near and dear to many tech startups that are seeking to carve out a space in the industry and grow to greater recognition. Um, so in a few words, could you just share with you, with me and the audience what you mean by playing bigger? Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, a, a basic that anybody knows in business these days is that in most digital markets, you identify any digital market and there's usually one player that absolutely dominates that market. And then, you know, maybe a second place that's doing pretty well and then a bunch of followers, um, you know. There's, you have your Airbnbs and your and your Ubers and your Salesforce.coms. I mean, they the business, the market that they're in, they take most of the economics of that market. So then, if you kind of reverse engineer that and you go, well, if that's the case, um, if you're starting a company or you're you're you know some years into running a company and you look around and you see that you're in someone else's market, you're probably in the wrong place because you're not going to be the one that's going to take. The majority of those economics. So the um, if you're thinking big, then you need to think about like how can we create a category of our own, a space of our own that didn't exist before, um, and define that space in a way that benefits us, so that we become that um, you know sales force of you know that particular market and and dominate things. So uh, the whole idea of the book was. Um, first of all, that's the reality, and that's the way companies that um, really want to think big should be thinking. But then the rest of the book is kind of a playbook. It's like if you're going to do this, how do you carry it off? Um, and yeah. that's you know that's what I think that's what's been uh, proven valuable to a lot of people. No, it makes a lot of sense. And like, what company would not want to play bigger? So let me share an example. We had a another expert on recently. Uh, her name is Robin Schaefer, and she has an analyst relations firm. And we got to chatting about creating categories and how to get analysts to kind of bless a new category. And maybe that's not, not the right way to go about doing it. But uh, anyway, her two cents were that it's very, very difficult to get a new category recognized, to get it established. And, uh, you know, we at Fusion PR have many clients that would love to punch above the weight class and they want to play bigger. They want to do exactly what you're talking about. But it's not so easy, right? I mean, is it like capturing lightning in a bottle? Does it happen very rarely or what, what is it? Well, I mean, uh, you, you know, I mean, yes, it certainly does. I mean, it does happen fairly rarely, but, um, but the purpose of the book or the playbook is to try to make your odds greater than it would, they would be if you just sort of did it by, you know, hope by hope and chance. Um, right. Well, I, you know, I'll answer the, you, you brought up the, um, analyst question to me before too. Um, so uh, it's true. I mean, it's really hard to get Gartner to create a brand new you know, category of some sort, but you have to remember, I mean, analysts are followers. Analysts don't go out and decide here's a new category of business that needs to exist. And hopefully some companies will go into it. Have you ever told Gartner that? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. They, they, they see what other companies are doing. And when somebody creates a category and starts to actually make something of that category, then that becomes a category. Right. So, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Thing. I mean, you can't um, you can't expect that um, a category is going to exist unless you create it, um, and okay. and uh, and then you have to you know you have to believe in it. You have to believe in it enough that you don't need um, 
you know, an analyst to, to rubber stamp it, to make sure that, um, you know, you're going to go forward with it. I mean, I don't think that, you know, when sales, when Mark Benioff started creating salesforce.com, um, that, that, uh, the, you know, there was a category of cloud-based CRM that existed yet. There was CRM and maybe, and within that CRM category, there might've been some that were edging into some cloud stuff and things like that, but, you know, that didn't exist until, until Benioff made it exist. I see. So I guess one of the, uh, tips is not to wait for the analysts or rely on them necessarily. Um, but we always, but we always tell clients too to, to, um, to try to bring them along to, you know, they, you know, I mean, you know, a, 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 a gardener analyst would love to find a new category and create it and, you know, make it, it's, you know, his or her own. So, you know, um, you work with the analysts, you make sure they know what you're doing. You, you tell them why you're different from other things and, um, and, you know, hopefully you win, you win somebody over that, that ends up realizing that this is an important new, you know, new category to define. And they would love to be the ones that define it first. Well, as Ken Kesey said, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. Um, so hopefully they'll come along. Now, what is the, how do you know if your solution could qualify to be a uh, category king? Well, well, again, okay. So like that, that the, uh, there's a, there's a purposefulness and an intentionality about category design that is way more than just like, okay, we've got this thing. Um, let's see if it qualifies for something or if it, so the whole idea is to actually, instead of, instead of thinking like uh, we make this thing and we're going to tell people about it and hope that it finds some place and it, you know, right. creates some new space or something like that. The idea is to actually sit down and look at, um, the you know the markets that are out there, the problems that are being solved or not being solved, you know what what your company's you know mission and specialization might be, and put all those things together and and actually identify the new space that doesn't exist yet, the problem to be solved that's not being solved, or the problem that's being solved really badly by some old solution that people didn't know there was some new way to do it, um, and. And we've worked with a number of companies that have actually shifted their product um, to once they see this new space that must exist um, and, and shifted their product to actually address that, that new space rather than ha we have this product, let's hope that somebody figures out what to do with it. So it's a different way of thinking. So in other words, the strategy starts first. I mean, you can't, not everybody can be king, right? Don't you have to have something special or unique in your, in your stack there in your IP? You have to have something that could potentially rise to that level. Well, I mean, yeah, true, but the the, the point is to be purposeful about it. Okay. To to actually actually to think through like what is this new space that we can create that doesn't exist yet? Because I mean, it goes back to what we just started with, which is that um, by definition, if you're going into somebody else's market, you stand a far less chance of doing well than if you can create a new market. I mean, that's just that's right. just the way right. things work. Right. That makes sense. Um, and and so so even like um, uh, and, and even if it's even if it's just somewhat subtle, like here here's a good example. We're we're actually doing this interview on Zoom. Yep. Um, and you know, long before Zoom existed, there were all sorts of different ways to talk to somebody by video. But there were but they basically had two different camps. There was the sort of Skypes of the world, which was a consumer way to communicate essentially didn't really wasn't really a workplace kind of setup thing it didn't right. really have desktop sharing and all those kinds of things that work and then there were these sort of web axes of the world which are the which are these kind of clunky that started with they actually started with desktop sharing and then you know and then added video on top of that um, and in fact i know before the pandemic most of the time when i had webex calls with companies nobody would turn their video on they just did the audio and the desktop sharing parts. So then Eric Wan comes along and he creates um, a Zoom, which is a video first business teleconferencing. I mean, I don't know what you describe the category, but it actually fit in a space that didn't exist yet. Easy to use, video first, video great quality, but also easy to share desktops, put up a whiteboard, all these other kinds of things. Boom, this thing finds a, a, a new space in between these old spaces. And suddenly, you know, I mean, Zoom is now a, a verb, right? I mean, we, right. Well, we talked about we're going to Zoom. 
Wasn't their space in some ways catapulted by the pandemic, by the, the fact that everybody? Oh, sure. The pandemic, the pandemic gave it a giant boost, mm-hmm. but he was already that was already on its way before the oh, pandemic. Hit. So they they were well positioned for right for that. They they, they just have they got lucky. They were perfectly positioned um, when the pandemic hit. But you know my you know my eighty four year old mom knows what you know how to zoom. Um, she, she would she would have a fit if somebody sent her a WebEx link. <laughs> <laughs> Or teams. Um, maybe, or help, teams. <laughs> maybe help everybody understand if you kind of take us through the process of it, maybe use an example from personal experience. Uh, do you have one you could talk about? Sure. Um, I, 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 I know we can talk about these guys because they've been very vocal about um, there's a there's a, a, a company called um, called Noodle, Noodle.ai, started oh, by some. Funny um, name. That's a good, yeah. And started by some. Um, real actually tech veterans that have been around for quite a while and, and know this, these spaces. And um, so when um, Noodle started working for us, they were, they were um, kind of positioned around this idea of enterprise AI, um, and which is kind of amorphous and-, That's and true. Who's not enterprise AI? <laughs> I know, right. And, and, and uh, uh, and there were other companies like Tom Siebel C3 or whatever that are also also mm-hmm. claiming that you know that space, um, and uh, um, and and as we started to talk with them and talk with what their best use cases were and what this you know who was who was finding them an interesting solution to problems that they couldn't solve before, um, started focusing on manufacturing operations, and and this ability to use AI to um, to uh, uh, what we started talking about was create perfect flow sure. from from raw material to um, to shelf, and, right. and and by doing that, um, Is optimization or well, yeah, I mean like stream optimization so that, okay. it, that you end up um, you know with with uh, minimizing waste, um, and minimizing um, you know uh, uh, energy use, and and making sure the supply chain is you know always in sync, and um, and. And uh, so we had to, we got talking about this conversation about perfect flow, and that that manufacturers have always had a difficult time, to, even despite all these point solutions that they would buy right. to try to do this. Um, and we came up with the term flow operations, and um, and and uh, actually uh, cool. abbreviated the flow ops. And then they did a great job of. Um, so, very evocative, so, very evocative flow up. So, so they so they saw the space, they saw this idea, labeled the labeled the category, and then and then put out material, whether it's marketing, PR, um, just sort of their own corporate, you know, the mission statements and everything that that lined up behind that category idea and defined it in a way that gives noodle an advantage if anybody else comes into the market. Now you you, you don't create a category with one company. I mean, a category is a category is a place where a lot of an ecosystem, you know, evolves. Um, but you, so, but you want to create that category so that it, it, um, you know, adheres to your vision of what the category yep. should be so yep. that you always have the advantage of, of um, defining it and driving that category. And so, I mean, this is only fairly recent. And if you look on Noodle's website, noodle.ai, for instance, they've done a great job of conforming the website to this category. It's all about that now. Um, they've done some brilliant marketing cat- campaigns on um, using Clubhouse, using um, using some you know uh, uh, some events that they've been doing, and and um, so they're they're really trying to define this category and own it, and and make it something that's going to be you know going to be enormous at some point. Would you say they are getting there, or uh... well, they, they just started. Um, okay, I mean, I we see. worked. We worked with them several months ago, and they've gone. I mean, they have done an amazing job of going all out um, to try to to try to capture. Okay. So you yeah, think just they're well the on their way. Couple of months. What's that? So you think they're well on their way? Yeah, yeah, I do. What um, you know, what are the steps like? What are some of the milestones in mm-hmm. uh, you know designing a category, playing bigger? Sure. Well, um, so it, it's it starts. It really starts with. Um, with thinking broadly and thinking in, in the context of what's out there. Um, you know, when we work with uh, some company, we end up doing this in a, you know, really intense set of workshops, but a, com- a lot of companies do it. We, we hear all the time for people who read the book, for instance, and write it and say, you know, we, we, 
we followed your guidelines and did this ourselves. I mean, it's certainly possible to do that. And, um, but it, it starts with um, really thinking, what is the problem that you actually solve? Um, and is that problem a new problem or is it something that uh, a problem that's existed for a long time, but just gets solved in bad ways by old, you know, old solutions? Um, so if you can identify a, a new problem or a problem to solve in a new way, you've probably identified a, an open space that you can go to. Um, and that's a harder question than it sounds like. I mean, you go to a lot of companies, most, I would say 90% of the companies we ever talked to, and, and you start with the conversation with, well, what, so what problem do you really solve and for who? And the next thing they tell you is what their product does. <laughs> features and benefits, features and benefits. Right, right, exactly. Which is speeds and speeds. <laughs> which is the, 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 actually the upside down way of really capturing people's attention. Exactly. Um, if you can tell people, and I mean, look, think of, think of every um, terrible TV infomercial you've ever seen, right? And it starts out with, you know, isn't this a terrible, like, you know, you have to scrub this pot and it's, you know, whatever, yeah. it's, everything sticks, it's <laughs> awful, you know, and it makes it look even worse than it ever actually is. But it starts with a problem. And then you, you, then you kind of go, well, yeah, actually, I, it does suck that I have to do that. And then, and then they introduce the solution to the problem. So you're saying they're brilliant. <laughs> I'm saying that they, they are. They're well, not a cell. We understand. They know, they know how to. There is a reason that those things have existed in that same format for 50 years, right? Um and uh, so, so we you start with that, um, and then um, and, and then we advise to say like, look, that once you identify that problem, um, write a point of view, write this 800, 1,000 word document that describes the problem, and then describes what the solution looks like, not like about your product, but what does the solution to that problem look like. Um, and, uh, and then, it, you know, the, and then at the end, talk about like how the world works, what the world looks like if that solution gets put into place. And now you've basically defined a category and how it should work. Um, you, you define the problem you define the solution you just, you've created a vision for this category. Um, and now it's on paper and you can give it to anybody. Um, in the company or, or, or uh, partners that you work with, suppliers, whatever, and they will know exactly what you're trying to do. Like a manifesto kind of? Yeah, basically like a manifesto, right. But, but it, I would, in, in, it's important that it is in a format like that where you start with a problem, the solution, future vision. Got it. Um, Got it. So you have a very specific format for it. Yeah, very, and, and recommend you know, doing that because it, it creates some discipline around thinking about the problem first, rather than going out to the world and saying, here's what our thing does, you figure out what to do with it. Um, and, uh, and once you have that, that POV, then, um, then make sure the whole company is aligned behind it and, and make sure that the marketing and PR's messages are aligned with it, but also that the products that the product development team is working on are aligned with it. Um, even the way, even possibly the way that you, um, hire people or the kinds of people you hire might have to be um, slightly different from what you did before if once you identified that category. Is it tough to get a consensus? I would imagine this is kind of top-down CEO driven or well, uh, you know, well, when we work with a company, we we insist that it ends up being six to ten people or so in the room, okay. the leadership team. And if you're doing it on your own, um, then you should. It should be something that you include all the important decision makers at the company should be part of the process so that they feel like they own the solution because you do need that alignment and you need every one of those people to be able to go to the rest of the company and say, this is what we're about. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and, and, you know, and then you start putting out the, um, you know, on the marketing side, the PR side, you start putting out the message that this is what we do, what we are, what this category is like. I mean, in any way you can, so that you become the one associated with that, you know, that new solution, that new category. Um, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and start to try to own it over time. And this is, a, this is something that takes, you know, years of constant drumbeat, constant work to make sure that this happens. It doesn't, it's not something that's going to just happen because you, you know, put out one press release on one, you know, one day. Mm, um, that, so that makes sense. It's a, you know, this is a, this is a whole, whole company strategy you got to work at. Speaking of press releases, there's one passage I love. I think it's page 105. I don't know if you can see the book. 
So no, it's fading in the background. Do you have a copy? <laughs> Not in my head. So, but anyway, uh, let's see. You've got to do something to cut through the noise and get into people's brains. I mean, that really defines, I guess, our job in the, in the PR realm, at Fusion PR. So we try to do. Not always so easy. But you talk about, I think, lightning strikes and hijacking. Could you explain some of the PR tactics that can help support a playing bigger strategy? Sure. Well, for one thing, just just starting with the simple thing was the press release. Um, you know, there is a there is a look. I mean, I was a journalist for God knows how many decades, yeah. <laughs> and and got God knows how many million some press releases in my time. Offered oh, quite um, a few PR pitches, huh? And and the and the, you know, and press releases tend to have they have kind of a standard format and a standard sort of sound to them. You know what? Break that. Um, yeah. right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, look, don't use a press release to a different kind of press release. Do no, it no, a headline. I mean, for, no, I mean, for just the way it's written. I mean, okay. uh, uh, um, even this idea of, uh, of, of, of being articulate about the problem that's being solved rather than start, I mean, every press release starts out with, you know, uh, such and such a company, uh, that, that has created a revolutionary new product yeah. that does yeah, this, yeah. whatever. I, I mean, so I don't, right off the bat, I don't know what you're good for if that's the way your press release starts. So tell me first what you're good for. And then, then tell me all the, you know, the, the language about your, what you do and everything else. Uh, that's just one way to think about it. Um, but, you know, certainly, I mean, look, it is all about getting attention. So you're going to get um, attention if the press release looks and feels and reads something that's uh, uh, different from every other press release that's out there. That's just a starting point. But um, yeah, we talk about in the book, um, one, of, one of the taxes we talk about is lightning strikes, which is um, the idea of finding some some way, uh, um, uh, some event maybe to, uh, or, 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 you know, Mm -hmm. meaningful date or something like that, that you can muster all of your resources around um, to, to really blow out uh, uh, the message of this category exists now. Um, you know, it's it versus the idea of just sort of like trickling out stuff all over, you know, throughout time. I mean, think of it like the way um, a blockbuster movie gets marketed when that movie's about to come out, suddenly you see ads, sure. um, ads and marketing messages and sure. maybe, you know, take over the, the, the street lights in a city and you put signs up all over, you know, whatever, you know, you do those kind of, like, all like sort of focused on yeah. the opening of that movie. Um, and one tactic is to think about opening the category with that kind of a, you know, a, a concentrated push. Yeah. That makes sense. What does hijacking mean? Hijacking is, um, I mean, it's tremendously successful um, way to do it, which is basically, um, uh, uh, you know, keeping an eye on the news and understanding the context of what's happening out there um, and and hijacking an event um, or a news event or something and saying that that is relevant to your category. So something happens in the news that you, you well, let me go back to Noodle, for instance. So um, they did a brilliant thing when that uh, ship blocked the Suez Canal. And suddenly all of these supply chains were just completely screwed. And, um, and, and, you know, and, and, this, and the topic of a supply chain and how it can be broken suddenly was in people's heads. Like normally you don't think about these things. Um, and so they used that news to put out a bunch of blog posts and, and you know, and, and press releases or, you know, anything they could do to further that message of um, how important sure, this sure. these perfect flow is. And, and anticipating problems that could happen. I mean, nobody, that's a black spot that nobody could anticipate that. But, you know, but they could use that news because it was in people's heads at that time. That makes sense. To, to, um, to get their point across. So that was a yeah. great example of it. Right. We talk about newsjacking, which sounds similar. You had some very specific examples in the book that involved hijacking a competitor's news or vendor news. Uh, I think you, you cited an example from Microsoft, which is very cool, I thought. Now, one more question. Yeah. Mel Brooks said, it is good to be king. How good is it to be king? And let me ask the question another way. A challenge we sometimes face in PR when we want to look to the long term and do things like build brand or maybe work on category PR is that it's hard to prove ROI, right? So you said you have to take kind of a long term view. 
Is it difficult to get sponsorship for this kind of program? Uh, and is it hard to prove ROI for a successful, you know, category engineering uh, program? Well, first of all, um, this does not work unless the CEO, it's a CEO on down. Thing. Right. Um, if, the, if the marketing department is just running this or the PR department is just running this, this is going nowhere. Um, so uh, um, every successful you know, company that we've ever worked with in this realm, it's been driven by the CEO. The leadership team is complete buy-in by the time we get that POV done. And, and um, the, uh, you know, that, that takes a lot of pressure off of some department having to prove, you know, prove ROI or prove that they're, you know, the value of their existence. Um, but, you know, but, but there, but we, we, all, we do, we talk, we talk to every company about um, there is a certain amount of courage involved in this. Um, we, we, we bring up the, the, the phrase that we learned from some VCs in Silicon Valley called the zero billion dollar market. And the, a zero billion dollar market is a, you know, is great because in a way, because it's a, it's this a market with enormous potential that only you can see because you've identified it. Um, and so if the, if it really is a, a zero billion dollar market, you've got some runway before somebody else comes in and tries to, you know, compete with you or whatever. The hard part about a zero billion dollar market is the same thing, is that nobody else can see it yet. Right. And so your job becomes then, um, whether it's investors or whether it's the you know, potential customers or, or analysts, whatever, to help them see that. Mm -hmm. And it takes some courage and belief. And, and it's the classic story of Airbnb getting turned down by 72 VCs before the 73rd finally gave them some money. Um, because nobody could see um, that zero billion dollar market yet, um, but it, obviously it existed. Well, the words vision and leadership come to mind. But mm -hmm. um, as I understand, as I read in your book, that the ones who are successful at this do, I mean, by definition, they're the category king. So they do better in the marketplace. They command more, you know, uh, sales, market share, et cetera. So there are very hard benefits to uh, results to this kind of strategy. Would you agree? Well, well, absolutely. And, you know, the, um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to measure exactly, but if you take almost any version of measurement, whether it's, um, let's let, whether it's market share, um, whether it's, um, a, a to, you know, like the total revenues of the space and who brings in the most, um, the total market cap of players in the space, you will almost always find that there's one company that's taking like 70% or plus of that particular measure, that metric. Um, and somebody else is taking 15 or 20% and then a bunch of stragglers who hmm. you know, take the rest. You know, on-demand transportation and the Uber, Lyft and everybody else is, is a good example of that in the US anyway. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, if you end up becoming that category king, you um, you have pricing power. You have um, you know you have the power to, to get the best you know the best partnerships. Uh, um, you're gonna and, and there was even a LinkedIn study at one point um, several a few years ago after the book came out. Um, LinkedIn hired um, a woman who was Jack Welch's uh, uh, wife and uh, no. I'm sorry, Susie Welch. No. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, uh, hired her to um, to do some analysis on, on on LinkedIn data to try to figure out what companies um, the most talented people wanted to work for, and um, and when she ran the data and she had actually read Play Bigger, oh, and wow. when she ran the data she ended up realizing that most of the companies that landed at the top of the list could easily be identified as category kings. Um, and as the play as play bigger de defined it, and she actually ended up calling one of our co-authors, Al Ramadan, and, and uh, interviewing him. Wow, that's wild! Um, and so again, I mean, another benefit: I mean, people want to work for the company that's driving a category, creating a new category, doing Absolutely. something new and fresh. So you will get the best people, and that actually increases your lead. Do many of these kings have second acts? I'd imagine there's a shelf life to being king, and things change, and over time, there's new technologies. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, you know, I would recommend a, um, a book to any of your listeners who are interested in this by a guy named, economist named Paul Gorosky, which is called okay. G-E-R-O-S-K-I. It's called The Evolution of New Markets. Um, and he's an economist who studied categories and how they evolve. And they do, um, they, they do have a natural life cycle. And, um, and the life cycle goes through a phase, early phase of being, you know, small and not very interesting to, um, you know, a high growth phase to a place where it levels off and, and over time um, does start to, to mature and, you know, and tail off. Um, so you can expect that that's going to happen. Now, the, you know, the great companies, the great enduring companies, um, you know, I mean, Apple is probably one of the best examples there is, um, but I could also talk about a 170 year old company called Corning that's done this over and over again oh, wow. is to, to set up a flywheel where you're constantly creating new categories. Mm. Um, and, that's interesting. and um, you know, that, that's, that's the way to become a, you know, an enduring longstanding company is to constantly create new categories. That's wild. Um, anything else we should know about the strategy about CDA, your firm there, category design advisors? Yeah, well, you know the the look. I I I was a, you know, I was a journalist and an author, and that's what I thought my career would always be. And uh, Play Bigger came out, and and um, we were getting all these calls from CEOs saying, you know, come help us do what your book describes. And uh, so um, myself and one of the guys who was in the circle of all these, my, so my co-authors for you know several decades. Um, form this firm to try to actually do that. So there's us, uh, Category Design Advisors. There's actually a firm called Play Bigger, which one of my co-authors, uh, Al Ramadan, is still, that's his uh, work. Uh, and um, Christopher Lockhead, one of the other co-authors, is uh, actually has a podcast that uh, focuses oh, really? a lot on category creation, category design. Excellent. So we're all in this space. Um, the book has, has, you know, changed all of our lives and put us into this, uh, into this realm. That is great. So I think we're done. Are we done? Sure. We're done for this go around, but I would encourage everyone to look up Kevin Maney and his firm and go to Amazon or wherever it's sold and buy the book. I'll have some notes about where to find this information and links in the description. And I want to thank you, Kevin, for your time. This has been extremely uh, very informative and um, look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Bob. Well, great to be on. Appreciate you it. want to close out with the Zoom 5? Okay, here we go. I don't know. How do, how do you do this? Just to, your, to the camera. <laughs>